Well, hello and welcome. Thanks for joining this week's panel conversation uh, where we're, we're discussing the challenges of engagement with local government leaders. Uh, my name is Matt Fulton and I'm the vice president for a company called Polco. We work with communities around helping to build engagement and strong performance. <clears throat> and we've been holding these weekly panel conversations to get people's perspectives on how they are addressing the challenges of resident engagement, particularly during the past year of kind of being in a, uh, in a virtual world. Um, um, our panelists today are gonna be talking about what actions they've taken, what solutions they have uh, used to, to make sure that you've got that connectedness so that residents feel like they're being listened to and they have that connected connection with the community um, and ultimately maintaining that overall sense of community. But the intent of the conversations is that you pick up a new idea, that you maybe garner a, a new solution, a new approach that might be able to help you in the work that you're doing in local government uh, and to just benefit from the perspectives that these leaders uh, present. Here's kind of the format of the day. Um, I'll do a quick introduction of the panelists and allow them to kind of expand on it. And then we'll jump into the questions. We'll rotate the questions between the panelists. And then at the end, I'll provide an opportunity for the panelists to have some interaction between themselves if there's any questions that they wanna follow up on. And then we'll wrap it up. And uh, we've typically found that these sessions last about, uh, about an hour, but it's been a really valuable hour. So let me do this. Let me uh, introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Lon Pluckin, who is the city manager in Marion, Iowa. Uh, Marion is the second largest city in, in the Cedar Rapids metro area. He's originally from the western side of the state and attended Iowa State University, where he got graduated with a master's degree in public administration and community and regional planning. Lon's been working in the public sector for 26 years starting his career in regional planning before moving into city management uh, back in 1998, which seems like a long time ago. Um, prior to starting with Marion, he served as city manager in West Liberty and Platteville, Wisconsin. Uh, Blonde's been a very active member and a very well-recognized uh, professional in local government. He served as a past board member and president of the Iowa City County Managers Association. Um, and then he's had a recent tenure as a vice president on the ICMA Board of Directors. Um, uh, so with that, Lon, thanks a lot for joining us on the panel and uh, congratulations on everything that you've been doing in your career. And I would love for you just to add a little bit more about your background. Sure. So uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, I've been doing this for a while now and you're right. 1998 does seem like it's quite a while ago. Um, when I started in regional planning, I had a heavy focus on economic development. I was the uh, local assistance director for a council of governments over in Western Iowa for about five years. So uh, the, one of the things I think that helped me bring forward was really looking at things from a regional perspective and now having the opportunity to work in a community that's part of a larger metro area. That's really, I think, served me and the community well, because uh, we're very interdependent. Uh, it's a case where you know, boundaries matter on a map to us, but don't necessarily matter to the people that live here or the businesses that operate here. So we do have to be able to cooperate on a regional level. Uh, as Matt said, I've spent the bulk of my career in Iowa with a four-year stint in Wisconsin uh, before coming back. I always joke around that I had to figure out a way to get back to Iowa because all three of my children were born during that stint in Wisconsin. So there must've been something in the water that we had to get away from or we were going to get ourselves in a, a lot of trouble. I've uh, been in Marion now for uh, 14 years as of March, so I've uh, been here quite a while. Um, really enjoy it. Um, consider myself to be a fairly dedicated uh, professional in the local government arena and just really enjoy the work. Uh, Lon, I, I can honestly say that over the course of my 30-year uh, career as a city manager, there have been numerous times that I have looked to things that you're doing um, um, and just kind of the way that you have led the profession. So uh, um, I just wanted you to know that and just really congratulate you for the work that you've been doing in Marion. Um, let me introduce our second panelist. Brenda Ivan um, is the city manager in Cedar Park, Texas, and has been in that role since 2006, although she served the community for about a decade in numerous other roles. Uh, in the organization. Cedar Park is a large and growing uh, community. Uh, she's got a $150 million budget that she oversees and has over 500 employees that she's responsible for. Uh, and so it is a, a big and challenging job. Brenda's got a master's degree in public administration and serves as an adjunct assistant professor 
for the LBA, LBJ School of Public Affairs um, at the University of Texas, Austin, teaching uh, classes in urban management. Um, Brent is also an active ICMA member as well as with the uh, Texas City Management Association. Uh, I gotta say, Brenda is, um, she didn't have it in her, her uh, material that she submitted to me, but doing a little bit of research, she has been a, a very well-recognized local professional as well. She's a recipient of the ICMA LP Cookingham Award for Career Development, and she's been recognized as the Public Administrator of the Year by the Central Texas American Society of Public Administrators. Um, finally, she was recognized by the Austin Business Journal for her influence as a professional uh, leader in local government. So Brenda, um, it's really nice to meet you and I really appreciate you taking some time to participate in this panel and would love to hear just a little bit more about your background. Great. Uh, hi, Matt and all, and thanks for having me here. Um, a little bit more about my background. You heard that I've been in uh, city manager for Cedar Park, which is a suburb of Austin, Texas. And any of us who've sort of watched where growth has happened in uh, in Texas, it's, well, actually in the nation, it has been around Austin. And so um, I actually came to this organization in the mid 1990s, my background's in human resources. And so when I came here, it was the very beginning of what Cedar Park was experiencing as uh, its growth boom. And so we've, we've sort of grown as cities have grown, which is a lot of houses and a lot of people. Uh, and then, you know, the retail development, now sort of the employment office development. Um, it is a, a first ring suburb. So we, we uh, border, Austin is just to our south. And um, what has happened in our region, for sure, when you're developing a community, is not only all the, the, the hardscape stuff, so all the infrastructure and roads and water and things like that, but we were also building a community and what, you know, what is, what does Cedar Park look and feel like and what is the quality of life like and how are people connected? So when Matt was talking about engagement, I'm like, oh yeah, we like, I'd love to talk about that today. So. Well, thanks. I, um, um, I totally appreciate the fact that um, when you're in a growing community, engagement just becomes that a growing community, especially in a, in an urban environment where you've got a, so many regional implications, having the um, having engagement at the forefront and building community, like you say, is such an important thing. And so I'm really excited, Brenda, to hear about uh, how you've been doing in Cedar Park. Just thanks for thanks a lot for being part of the conversation today. Our third panelist is Doug Lachance, uh, uh, who graduated from Penn State University with a public administration master's degree, and um, his career actually started with the outreach team at ICMA. Um, but after a couple of years, he joined State College um, as their communications specialist. Uh, over the course of the last several years that I've gotten to know Doug, um, he's been doing just great work for his community and he was promoted to the assistant to the manager position to oversee all of the organization's communications and uh, high priority projects for the community. Um, uh, he's a very active person professionally and was recognized for a lot of his skill set. Uh, just was recently recognized by ELGL with a Traeger Award as a top local government influencer. Uh, I've gotten to know Doug and Doug has helped us with some presentations recently with the ICMA regional presentations on some of the experiences that they've had um, around civil unrest and, um, and policing. And uh, so I'm really glad, Doug, that you were able to join us today. Would you mind just sharing a little bit more about your background? So, uh, so you know, just er I'm, I'm fairly early in my career, even though I've been, you know, in in the profession and around the profession for the last seven years. Uh, uh, during school, I had uh, during my uh, master study through Penn State, I had the opportunity to work as a management analyst for uh, uh, interim city manager and in Altoona named Peter Marshall. Uh, he uh, he really taught me a lot about the profession and, and, and motivated me to get involved in local government and get involved with professional associations. And that's what led me to work for ICMA. And, and I just think it was just, I had a unique and, and, and lucky experience to be able to not, not experience local government from just a, a community level, but to, to experience it from a community level and communities across the country. I got, I was, I ran their blog. I started their podcast. I got to interview, I got to meet managers, got to meet local government professionals. Professionals and, and understand, you know, the various challenges that, 
that local governments faced across the country. And then uh, having the opportunity, I'm originally from central Pennsylvania, alumni from of Penn State University, and have the opportunity to come work uh, in uh, the borough of State College, uh, where, where Penn State University is at, and move back closer to home. It was just, uh, again, just lucky, and, and, and I'm fortunate to get the job and and grow along with the with the job uh, here here in State College. Uh, and just to tie it back is, is that that um, city manager I worked with in Altoona is now an elected official on our city council. He used to be <laughs> in State College. So it's really a full circle uh, experience for me in my, you know, my early career. That's great, Douglas. Uh, it kind of shows you too in local government, your paths can take many different twists and turns. So <clears throat> really appreciate you being here. Um, well, today we wanted to talk a little bit about maintaining a sense of community in a socially distanced world. And um, it really is in recognition that COVID has really disrupted any sense of community in, um, um, in all of our communities. It's just been such an unsettled environment, not only for you as leaders of your organizations, but your organization generally as you evolve to a, a virtual um, environment and had to impose some new technologies and uh, deliver public services in a whole different way, including the way you engage with people, but also from a community standpoint and a residence perspective where you're homeschooling your kids while you're trying to maintain your job. And um, um, all of it plays into how do you make those connections work between a resident stakeholder who has invested everything into the community and the impact that they can have and the involvement that they can have on the conversations and decisions that are meeting, being made by local government decision makers. Um, uh, the pandemic has created all sorts of challenges in maintaining the sense of community. And so we really just kind of want to learn about how have you maintain your sense of community in such a disruptive world. Uh, you know, if we kind of back away from just even a little bit more and think about where we're at as a society, uh, engagement has never been easy. I can remember the pre-COVID days, um, it would always be so frustrating to me to be at a meeting where you had more staff than residents attending. Um, and it's, you know, there's a lot of logical reasons for it. We're really not aligned well for meeting people's personal uh, schedules. Um, people have other priorities going on in their life. And so, uh, and a well-run organization gives people kind of the flexibility of not really paying attention. Um, so it's always been difficult, but then you throw on the pandemic and, um, and of course, more recently, the polarization and the divisiveness of our, of our society in so many different ways, all the civil unrest and all of the other things that are kind of impacting on our community. And it just really elevates the importance of having this kind of a conversation about how do you help to make sure that your residents are connected into, um, into our overall community and um, helping to make sense, make helping to inform decisions that are being made that will determine the future of your community for, for generations. So as we start to think about this conversation, there's three questions that we're gonna be posing to our panelists. The first one is how has your communication strategy uh, evolved since the beginning of the pandemic? Uh, the second one is how does resident engagement influence your success in maintaining a sense of community? And then finally, which tools do you currently use to measure feedback from a resident's perspective during these challenging times. And Lon, I really would love to start with you with that first question. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Marion's communication and engagement strategy has evolved since the start of the pandemic? Sure, uh, I would say we've been steadily moving towards increasing the use of our social media presence to begin with. Um, but for a long time, uh, our different social media pages, for example, the library, the police department, the city, um, didn't necessarily always push out the same messaging. They were, they tended to be more uh, inward focused on the services that they were providing. And as this uh, really kind of came into being, I did have a few advantages. One is that I have a, a person who is an events coordinator for the city. Uh, unfortunately, she shared with us later that she started to feel like her title should be events canceller, but she has a... <laughs> strong background in communications. And she helped us to really revamp some of our communication strategy for consistency of messaging, reaching out through other different forms of media, um, just really trying to make sure that we were, as we were releasing information um, related to COVID or other topics, that it was coming out from multiple different sources. Um, they also worked uh, very heavily to coordinate with our community partners. So our Economic Development Corporation, Chamber of Commerce, Main Street Organization, 
really stepped up to the plate to help us to keep our communities and business partners engaged. As you can imagine, uh, with COVID, as particularly in a lot of the shutdowns, our retail sector, um, hospitality sector was really struggling. And so those organizations really became kind of a lifeline for pushing information out about resources available, where they could call to sign up for different relief packages um, to help kind of the community kind of navigate this. Uh, our situation in particular became a lot more challenging in August because we were hit with um, what's called a deratio, which was and is the largest natural disaster in Marion's history. Um, if you think about straight line hurricane winds and a swath 35 to 50 miles wide came through our community and um, we had entire portions of the city that lost power for up to six weeks. And so we'd been using social media, doing a lot of our communications electronically, and then all of a sudden lost the ability to communicate electronically. So for a while there, we pivoted and went old school. We were printing out flyers and handing them out at Walmart at tables and handing them out at the library, handing them out at the grocery store, just to, to, to uh, try to provide the public with information about the disaster recovery efforts underway, um, where you could find food, where you could find help, who you could call for temporary housing. Um, it was really uh, pretty disruptive. If you can imagine trying to uh, open an uh, emergency operations center under COVID protocols, uh, that was its own particular challenge, but we were able to make our way through it. In the broader context, we have been able to use some of the electronic platforms that were available to greatly, I think, increase our engagement and participation in some of our larger initiatives. While all of this was going on, we've been moving through an update to our Uptown Master Plan, which is a redevelopment streetscape project, plaza project, and we were able to work with with our private sector vendor to host a virtual Zoom meeting, we sent out, uh, again, old school notifications, um, postcards to every business owner and every building owner in Marion. And the turnout that we had for that particular event was probably five times what we've ever seen by doing the traditional open house. You know, we're going to have storyboards over at City Hall. Come visit with the staff and the consultants that are talking about this project. And it worked really well. So I think um, those are some of the things that we're going to carry forward from this. Because as a city, it doesn't seem to matter what time we set our meetings. Um, there's always going to be people that can't attend for one reason or another, whether it's because they're second shift workers or because your meeting starts at 530 and they're commuting from an hour away and so they can't make it. And being able to use those electronic tools has really allowed us to broaden our reach to folks who now no longer have to take that extra half an hour to travel back and forth to the meeting. The other thing I would say is that um, we have, we did deploy a product through a company called iCompass for online agenda management. And one of the nice things about that is that it lets people kind of track more live through the course of a city council meeting when and when a topic might come up for discussion. So rather than having to stay on for the entire three hours, you can kind of keep checking in periodically. And and then if you have a topic of interest, you can log in for that period of time where that piece is going to be discussed. So um, made a quite a few pivots, um, uh, admittedly very, very heavily dependent on uh, internet access, which has its own concerns about what areas of the community can't receive, can't receive that. Um, but that allowed us to do a lot of um, push polling and get feedback from people, even like the derecha that I was talking about, we used uh, Polco's assistance to um, survey people about what their needs were, um, what they they needed to be able to recover from that. And I think overall, there are a lot of pieces of this, even coming out of COVID, that we will just incorporate into our daily way of business doing forward. That's great. Um, thanks a lot for sharing that. I had forgotten about the weather related things, but it, it's a great indicator and, and a demonstration of how all of the local governments have been adaptive to kind of what's thrown at you. And um, I just always remember as a city manager, when you got into a challenging time like that, city employees step up to the challenge and you make it work and you find ways to make it happen. And, and uh, that's, those are some of my most proud moments when I kind of remember back how the organizations worked. And so thanks for sharing that experience. Um, and congratulations on your participation levels. We found through our research that participation has increased a lot just because of the virtual nature and the ability and convenience of the use of technology. So, um, so thanks for sharing that, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Brenda, could you share how your communication and engagement strategy has evolved in Cedar Park uh, since sure. the beginning of the pandemic? Sure. I think, you know, I want to say as Lon was speaking, I, I found myself nodding my head with yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, I think you may hear some of the same things. I think sort of the, the pre-pandemic um, 
while we have a community affairs team that that really their goal is to help increase uh, our citizen engagement throughout our community, there is sort of a, a heavy reliance on increasing your social media presence, not only pushing information out, but really monitoring uh, what kind of feedback may be happening outside your own posts. And so trying to get a sense of what's happening in the community through that. But when I think back to, again, sort of pre-pandemic, we had a couple of really large uh, community transformational projects that uh, were in these engagement um We were in an engagement heavy time. And and so pre-pandemic, we were really pushing this in-person come out. And it was sort of strange given my experience the first 20 years of of my career where like y'all talk about when you have town halls, you really don't get that much in-person engagement and, and you spend all this time. Well, what we had found the last couple of years were we were getting a lot of in-person engagement. I mean, you know, we'd have 600 people at a meeting about a project and those meetings, and we worked really hard on those meetings so that they were very interactive and we had opportunities to, to gauge feedback from our community. And, and we were really proud of that. Like I said, a couple of them are, are one's a large redevelopment project. One is a large uh, parks development project. One was about uh, some drainage, drainage projects we had. So while those meetings were smaller because we went into the neighborhoods, they really were sort of focused on this in-person, give us your feedback. We'll use some technology and and have some uh, opportunities for interaction in these meetings. And that's how we'll gauge our feedback. And then, of course, we hit COVID and suddenly like the world changed. And even though we had technology again, um, in our community engagement, we were not fully virtual. <clears throat> and so we went from a council meeting, all things normal, to two weeks later, Texas is sort of shut down and uh, we had to hit a bunch of buttons and suddenly become virtual. When we did that, we made a couple of decisions. And one of the decisions that we made was from the uh, public engagement piece, particularly in our council meetings at that time, uh, the sort of the standard was, yes, we want people to be able to, you know, we need people to be able to, to give us feedback. And so we will have this audio um, component to where people can participate and it's, it, you know, it's audio only. And we made a decision to like try to push and make it available. So it was uh, video as well. And so it was sort of funny. We had to revamp a lot of our our statements at the beginning of the meetings of when we call you and you press your video button, we can see into your home. So be aware of that. And if you don't want a scene in your home, you may, you know, you you can do this audio only. But it gave people, I think, a sense of interacting like in real life and and some level of normalcy, even though it wasn't sort of our, our normal protocols. So Making those switches really, I I think that the quickness of when you had to make all these changes uh, to where everything became virtual and you put services online that you hadn't had online uh, because your offices were not open to to, your day-to-day public. Once we sort of got the hang of it, what we found was, I think initially we had bigger projects that we wanted community engagement on and we tapped, our, we tapped the brakes. We were like, let's not push forward with the projects yet. I mean, COVID was so you know, unknown at that time that it, I think it paused a lot of, of what was happening initially. And then once you get a sense of, oh, I can operate in this world and I can operate in this virtual world what are the best ways to do that and continue to engage and with our community, we figured out that, yes, let's do a couple of town hall meetings with, with city council, not, not council meetings, but really like community, just town hall. There's no agenda. We're just taking questions and how we promoted that into our community and, and how we got people to engage in, in that setting. And so the first one that we did, we were sort of nervous, like, are we going to have two people, 2000 people? I mean, you really, you don't know. 
And uh, we had a we had a really good turnout. We were really pleased about it. And it sort of led its way into, oh, yes, now we're working on a couple of these other projects. We're in the middle of a, a full um, brand new library and library design. And we were like, well, we we're on a schedule. How are we going to do this? How are we going to engage our community in this design and programming discussion about a, a huge community asset? And so learning how to do those types of meetings and do them virtually. You know, we started with small focus groups and, and then we did a lot of surveying. And so the survey tools that are available for community and how the communities really responded to that. I mean, we get more feedback through that tool today, I think, than we did two years ago. Um, surveying as we've been doing some recruiting for um positions in our organization, uh, like I said, major projects, smaller projects. So trying to look for ways in which we're coming to you and also finding platforms that make it easy for the public to come to us and finding ways to, to make those connections. So those are just, a, I think, a couple of examples of, of things that we saw during this last year. Brenda, did you uh, did your council play? I think with your virtual town meetings, were those run by staff or those run by the council? Um, well, it was it was <laughs> our council actually would log in from home, except for our mayor. Our mayor was up at city hall with uh, our city management staff and our IT staff, and so our IT staff would would sit with the mayor, and as we were calling up, for example, if we were you know. Um, calling somebody from the public to speak, he would, he would, our IT folks would actually run that. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting story. And it sounds like you haven't, you're, you're continuing to meet all of those public expectations and projects just using a virtual approach, which. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I think so. We've gotten a lot of really good feedback and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, really good high participation. Yeah. And like I said, in the beginning, you, you just weren't really sure what you were, yeah. how you were going to be able to manage that, that input. And were you providing the, were you providing all the opportunities that you could for the community to give you input and such? Yeah. So I think we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. I agree with Juan. Some of these things we will absolutely keep in place. Uh, because they've provided other forums and, and other ways for people to give us feedback. That's great. Thank you. Douglas, can you talk about how uh, State College's communication and engagement strategy evolved over the past year? So, uh, so uh, as I do everything, it's always with a with a story. So, whenever we started the the pandemic, uh, our uh, well, the pandemic started us. I mean, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, it, it it was really uh, a lot of unknown here. It was really a lot of uh, we already had a uh, a plan in place for the last influ influenza outbreak and the, and the SARS outbreak. We had a, a continuity of operations plan, which did have a communications component of it. However, as uh, as the organization involved, uh, especially uh, prior before I got here, we already had the uh, digital focus, meaning we were sending out less mailers. We were, we were, uh, we had built a pretty strong social media community. We built strong listservs, long, uh, uh, strong, uh, you know, lists of, of people uh, that we email out communications to. So about the first month of the pandemic, we were, we were utilizing those digital platforms, leveraging the channels that we've been, we've been successful in utilizing in the past. Um, Zen City, it's uh, if no one if no one knows that is Zen City is a platform that takes on all of the online public conversation through an AI and actually attach a sentiment to it. You can run reports based on keywords. It allows you to more easily monitor the decision or uh, the conversations that are going on online. Um, they came out with a survey very quickly uh, uh, about a month in to assess our COVID nineteen response, and we had a lot of participation in that survey, and and it was really eye opening opening to see like, oh, we need to go back to the traditional means. People don't know the information that we need them to know. They don't know that we've switched from in-person council meetings to virtual council meetings. They need to know, you know, about who do we call to get help? 
businesses? Who who do we get in contact with to get uh, access to these relief packages and and various loan programs? And so we found ourselves going back to sending postcards, uh, utilizing light signs, uh, 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 handing out flyers, hanging flyers at at uh, grocery stores. All of these these you kind of dust off the old old communications uh, playbook in local government, and and that significantly changed how we did everything, the amount of people that we were able to reach and, and really help us uh, adapt to the, 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 our communication strategy, the pandemic, so that we were able to get information out, out to everyone. Um, the other thing that, that we, uh, that, that my staff and, 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 I worked on heavily is leveraging those partnerships that we had and, and their partnerships and, and those that provide service. We have a very strong nonprofit organization and, and service provider uh, economy here in State College to not only help students out, to help most those in needs around the, the region. And so our Office of Community Engagement all of a sudden had biweekly meetings with a conglomerate of these nonprofit organizations so that we knew what services they were offering. Uh, out of the cold is our, helped out our homeless. And so we were able to get additional funding to them to put homeless in hotels where they previously used churches. However, due to the pandemic, their the church setup was no longer uh, uh, usable so that to, to stop the spread. So these these hotels that we have around here because of uh, all of the visitors that Penn State does attract, they were sitting empty. So we're like, okay, here we have some funds. We have some CDBG. We have some federal funds. Let's utilize them, give them to out of the cold so that there, there's a place that, that homeless had to, had to go get resources and, and and clothing and food and shelter. And so, it, it you know, that's just one of the many examples of, of leveraging those partnerships. And the other thing that I did in terms of partnerships uh, and communications is, is uh, leveraging the ones that I've made, those friendships and the partnerships that I already had in place with those that, that handled the local media around here. And that was really key because uh, uh, with, with having, you know, student-based population and not being able to communicate, you know, a Effectively through Penn State, Penn State keeps a, a very much a tight control on their on their communications channels. Um, being able to leverage local media that and and you know those even those student runs uh, media uh, journalistic companies that 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 cater to students, leveraging those and creating a core group of people that I was every communications that we were sending out to the pandemic about the pandemic we were sending to them. So then they're pushing our our message out as well. And so it you know it's not only leveraging those nonprofit partnerships but leveraging the partnerships that we had in place for uh uh, uh, for communications. And then in terms of, of community engagement, we uh, we have uh, various neighborhoods that are led by people, or various neighborhoods with long-term residents, meaning that they're not densely populated uh, with student rentals. Um, obviously our downtown and adjacent to campus there, we do have some dense student population, but um, leveraging these uh, these neighborhood associations, we had a virtual town hall meeting every, every uh, Friday where the president of council joined us, uh, the mayor joined us, uh, all three borough managers joined us, different staff to just be there to ask questions. And, and again, they would, they have their own list serves to residents that move in the area. And, and, you know, even just talking neighbor to neighbor, they were kind of our boots on the ground in terms of, of communications as well. And so keeping them informed, answering their questions really helped us uh, for getting, you know, information out about our local COVID-19 ordinance, uh, information about how to attend a council meeting, uh, uh, information about what the library is doing in terms of book return, because they can't do book return in person. So it's really about uh, our, you know, the, the the crux of our story is really just understanding what partners you have in place and then also willing to adapt based on that feedback that we initially got a month in and and it really helped us us improve the communications that we were doing at the start of the pandemic to even where we're at right now today. What I love about that story, Douglas, is, uh, you know, you had a plan in place before pre-COVID you've already established these relationships. You've already got the engagement going on both to the student population and throughout your community. And just the value of having those relationships in place and having that capital in place so that as you then get into COVID, those are already existing. And um, I have to believe that that helped you sustain your way through this entire last year. 
Yeah, and and there's always this like in terms of of local government uh, communications, there's always the uh, the organic impressions. Those are what you're getting whenever you send stuff out on social media. You're sending stuff out, and then the um, the the earned impressions, as I like to call it, and that's whenever you leverage the partnerships for pushing it out uh, for you already. And and to to you know a lot of times if something's really important, I'll follow up with them. But uh, you know the majority of the time now that we have those those communication channels established, and and they're part of those lists serve their part they're already following us on social media that they're automatically pushing them out that it doesn't require any follow-up that's that's really what was nice to to uh we had that a little bit in place but throughout the pandemic to build those relationships and set up that so that so that it's it's easier on me because a lot of the at the beginning of it it's it's me and my staff trying to kind of you know, push a boulder up a hill, uh, essentially. Uh, but now it's just, you know, you hit one button send and, and you trust that it's going to go out all the other places you need it to go out. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for, for, uh, for sharing that. Let's move on to the second question. And uh, Brenda, I'd like to start with you. Can you talk about how engagement influences uh, Cedar Park's sense of community? Um, it's a great question. And, and when you first said that, you know, we all I think sort of rushed to this idea of, gosh, we've been online for a year now and what does that look and feel like in our community? But I think at the heart of that, when I, when I look back over the year and much like Ron, we actually had a significant weather event during all of this time. It was actually in, in um, February where I know you guys are used to ice and snow. Central Texas is not. And so uh, on, uh, yes. And so during this time, we also had this like hugely multi-day significant ice and snow event to where, um, again, this idea of people being separated and physically separated was sort of exponentiated. So I think at the, like at the end of the day, when I look back and think about the engagement processes, the messaging, um, whether it was through social media, whether it was through these, uh, you know, online events that, that we were coordinating, it really was trying to connect people who were physically disconnected. Because if you think about the beginning of COVID, people were scared and, and they really did look to their local government to be like, what is happening? What do we do? How do we do this? How long is this going to last? What does this mean? Our businesses were worried as you know, we were all trying to figure out what does this mean for our businesses as well. And so I think the piece about how do you, how does the engagement influence the sense of community? It really was about trying to make sure people had information. Um, there was our, our mayor was, who's active in social media anyway, uh, definitely I, we saw an increase in that messaging that was more personal, like it, it was really to our community and really um, trying to continue to encourage people to have a sense of community, even though there was social distancing. Uh, and so we saw that messaging and people really responding to that messaging. Because again, if you sort of think back about this initial, like really, fear. And you had people that were really still today along the spectrum of, you know, how, how, how they feel about, you know, the pandemic and, and the, you know, regulations or how we've all responded to it. And so I think it really was, again, trying to keep people somewhat connected when we were like physically connected. And I've heard both of y'all talk about your partnerships and I feel like that became part of our sense of community too, like our relationship, not just with our chamber and our business community, but also with our, our, um, our peers in our cities that, you know, are around us. I, you know, those relationships exist anyway, but for sure during this time, being able to, to communicate, whether it was through a, a, a quick Zoom or, or, you know, conference call or something of, what are y'all doing? What are y'all hearing? How can we all sort of coordinate as cities in our, in our region and in our county so that it's less confusing for all our residents? Uh, if, you know, one city's doing X and another city's doing Y, what are the rules? And so 
being able to, to have that information so that the sense of community was in your community, but it was also a little more regionally too, as we were able to talk about, are there things that we're going to be doing the same? If there are differences, why? Um, and then I think the other thing we did that I do sort of point to the sense of community is particularly in the storm, but utilizing this engagement is that we ended up having to go to this rumor patrol, which we'd never really had to do before. Uh, it was, and so we'd heard other cities that had, that had had to do it, but because the situation and utility situations were different between our cities, people would hear something about another city and think it was about ours. And so we really had to stay on top of this weird rumor control during that event. And, and uh, again, sort of get good information out and uh, again, keep people like connected. I'm so glad that you brought up the notion of regionalism and, and uh, the sense of community beyond your municipal boundaries. Do you think mm -hmm. that's going to be something that's going to carry on going forward? I do think it will. I think it will not only from like a municipal uh, staff type of thing, definitely at the elected official level as well, because we were all, I'm sure y'all experienced the same, we were all in these large conference planning meetings for months and months and months and months and months with our, you know, other cities, our county and uh, leaders and things like that. So definitely the relationships that get formed at that level. And I think you did see it at, at a, you know, citizen and business level as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Very interesting. Douglas, can you talk about how engagement uh, plays into maintaining a sense of community in State College? Yeah, and, and it, it, it comes from, you know, you, you have the sense of community whenever it comes to your business community, and then you have your sense of community in terms of your residents. Uh, uh, in terms of our business community, working with uh, the local chamber of commerce, working with the downtown State College Improvement District to understand what their needs were, um, that was really critical. We uh, also utilized Pulco to do a business needs survey for our local redevelopment authority, who was handling a lot of uh, taking the lead in terms of those federal dollars that we would get in the various packages to to distribute and develop programs for them so understanding what they're needing what they needed and and from day one we said this and this this came directly from the uh from the uh the borough manager was we need to balance our the economic health of of our community with the uh with the uh also the health needs of, of our community as well and so that taking that approach really helped us uh, uh get a lot of buy-in from from businesses because you know you see this around the country uh different regulations that you put in place don't always sell well to the business community because it adversely impacts them it, 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 and 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 they have the, they have to make their own, own living as well and so so working and, and understanding that sense that that community that business community and engaging them in the process was critical because uh because we need them to help you know create a safe environment for whenever the penn state students did return whenever residents do re and visitors return to the area we want to make sure that they do so in a safe manner and so working uh, through those partnerships and maintaining that sense of community amongst the uh, business community was was really critical. We have not since since about March last year we have not charged for parking on an on street parking. That is a lot of revenue that we're missing, but that helps them from a from a from a multiple standpoint. We still enforce the two hour limit, so we're getting turnovers because those spaces downtown are are valuable. But they're also able to start uh, adopting to the overall delivery economy that was coming out of, of this. And so you're able, you know, the Uber, uh, Uber Eats, the Grubhub drivers are able to pull DoorDash, are able to pull right in, grab their stuff and go. Allegheny uh, Appalachians Outdoors, one of the businesses downtown, was just having people shop online and they would just meet your curbside to, to handle the, uh, to do the delivery. And so, so having, so, you know, that's a community that, that was, it's critical to our local economy here and, and our, and our, our, 
our um, and, and our overall safety. And, and it's just great to see all of the businesses in downtown State College and throughout the community take these COVID-19 standards very seriously. They're, they're putting up the plexiglass, they're enforcing masking. We have a line limitation. So the local college bars are limiting the amount of people that they have in line. And, and just being able, uh, uh, building, focusing on that, that community was really critical because we rely on them in so many different ways. And then in terms of, of our regular community members, you have two, you know, you have our long-term residents and you have our student residents. We formed a, uh, we formed a task force with Penn State University, uh, the uh, uh, Center County Chamber of Commerce, Downtown State College Improvement District, Mount Nittany Health, which is a local health system, uh, and, um, uh, and, um, crap. Forget one for, oh, and the center county government, the government, uh, center county that was in charge of of uh, of bringing, you know, uh, handling a lot of the responsibilities from the Department of Health standpoint. We had a task force of leaders of those organizations. Uh, myself, the borough manager, uh, you know, hire us up VPs at uh, Penn State University, we, meeting weekly. Never has happened before. Never has happened in the history of State College, and and so uh, and so communications were coordinated and engagement opportunities were coordinated in a way that they've never been coordinated before so that not only our long-term residents are, are staying informed and engaged in the municipal process but uh, uh, also students and then the other you know the other thing that was going on here is um, March 20th of 2019 we had an officer involved shooting of a young African-American male as they were trying to serve a 302 warrant and and uh, and uh, you know right about uh, the the year anniversary of that in 2020 um, those those events by the local advocacy groups uh, were, were unfortunately canceled because of, of COVID-19 precautions. Um, the, uh, the incident, uh, the George Floyd uh, uh, murder uh, really was a catalyst for, for uh, those groups and others that are interested in fighting for uh, uh, criminal justice reform here to, to, um, to, it was really a catalyst for them to, we had, we had protests every every weekend. We uh, had uh, increased in attendance at our council meetings, especially during the budgetary process. Um, uh, Pulco, a national uh, uh, research center, had the National Police Services Survey. And, and we jumped on that opportunity because engagement's not just about those that are coming to the meetings, those that are uh, that are interested in speaking out of that. We need to have an understanding of, of, of the full community and those that are, are, are receiving police services because they may be afraid to come forward to uh, a council meeting. They may be a little bit timid to speak about pro-police and, 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 you know, just in fear of repercussions and, and, uh, and, and, um, and possible, you know, misconceptions about their overall intentions. And so being able to, to work with Pulco and have that, uh, have that scientific data available to us uh, moving forward is going to be critical because it's a, it's a scientifically valid sample of our full community and obviously where we're missing uh, some key sectors because of, of just trends in uh, taking surveys and and young adults and, and our student population but it really just provides us uh, a full picture of, of the overall you know perception of, of police services and opinions of police services here in the in the borough state college and again that helps build a sense of community i got so many phone calls about the fact like hey i i you know especially people that aren't because we did it online people that weren't able to take it online hey i really want to give feedback about the police department I, I really appreciate you sending this how can i give feedback and working with polco i actually had them do paper surveys and i would say just leave it out front i'll put it in the yellow envelope i would drop it off and say call me and I would swing back from my way home from work, grab it, and enter the data for them. It was really, it was really awesome to hear, you know, people that don't typically attend a council meeting really excited that we're asking their opinion. That's great. Uh, thanks, Douglas, for sharing that MPSS story. I'm glad that it's working, worked yeah. well for the for the community. Um, Lon, can you talk about how engagement um, has influenced Marion's success in maintaining its sense of community? Yeah, I think um, with our community, there's a couple of things that really do come into play outside of just uh, COVID and then the derecho that we had. One is that, um, you know, we're a growing community as well. And even during the worst periods of COVID, we still had lots of people moving to town. Um, and so trying to um, 
be able to incorporate them and help them build that sense of connection to the community um, can be really challenging when you can't do your normal things. I mean, I think uh, we've always had a pretty robust series of community events during the course of the year. Mm -hmm. And our Thursday night concert series in City Square Park is one of the most popular uh, things that we do. Thousands of people will turn out for that on a regular basis. And with all of those things being canceled, that was, I think, something that the community really missed as far as being able to maintain those personal connections with each other. Mm-hmm. You might have folks down there from other neighborhoods that, you know, you sit next to and you've been sitting next to on Thursday nights for years, and now all of a sudden you didn't have those options anymore. But I think this is an area where, um, in particular, our library and Parks and Rec and events staff were pretty creative as far as coming up with new ways for people to get engaged, as well as um, participate in some healthy behaviors. So, for example, Uh, our library put together book walks. They went out along the trails and made copies of pages from very popular books and then just put them along the trails to give people an opportunity to go out there and say, hey, I want to... to go out and do something different. I'm going to take the kids and we're going to go out and we're going to read this book along this particular trail today. Um, We did uh, a series of online events. Um, One of my favorite ones is the Geek Out About series, where we just bring in different experts to talk about different things for people to, you know, have an opportunity to learn about topics that they are interested in. So, you know, as we've kind of transitioned from a lot of those things would have been done in person and, um, we had to be very creative and intentional about finding different ways for people to continue to do those services. You know, unfortunately with the Duray show, um, we lost the use of our library and had to split the staff up into three separate locations. And that kind of continues to this day. So having that online platform available because of the COVID closure and then the additional restrictions we had um, because we don't have our former space available forced us to really move into that online platform. Um, we uh, kind of pirated an idea from the post office and put a book drop out in front of one of the temporary locations. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to lease an uptown building that the rear of it goes on to our uptown artway project. And so they would do book readings out into the public spaces um, and really reimagine how we used some of the assets that we already had in place. To support the business community, um, there were some restrictions that were eased by the state government as far as outdoor service areas and what options that um, different restaurants and uh, bars in particular had available as far as meeting the needs of their customers. So we took an area in our uptown that was a former bus stop and converted it into a special outdoor service area that allowed for outdoors, enhanced outdoor seating and additional service areas for alcohol. So if someone wanted to go over to one of the restaurants and pick up a dinner, but also come out there with a beer, as long as it was sealed and they brought it over to the uh, additional picnic tables and things that we set out, they had the option now of being able to do that. So we tried to provide some additional flexibility for those businesses to to take advantage of the avenues that were still available to them um, when they didn't have uh, the in-house or the indoor options. And I think, you know, it hasn't been perfect. I think we're at a point right now where people are definitely feeling some connection fatigue. Um, There's definitely a hunger as people are getting more people are getting vaccinated and we're seeing more of that. that People are having more of a strong desire to get outside. Um, We're fortunate enough to be in an area where our viral activity is pretty low. And so we have been able to kind of move into some phased reopening of some of our facilities, Um, you know, for single parties, if you want to have someone wants to rent a shelter house under certain restrictions, they're allowed to be able to do that. Uh, The other thing that I would say that's, I think was a permanent benefit for us coming out of this is it really solidified our relationship with our county public health department. Um, Our mayor was participating in press conferences that they were doing so that uh, to the point Douglas made earlier about consistency of messaging that um, if there was anything that was a little bit different uh, about the Metro communities, we could provide that information directly. I I joke a little bit and say, that um, during the course of this year, about the only uh, forms of communication that we didn't use were carrier pigeons and shortwave radio, but we really <laughs> kind of threw everything else at it to, to <laughs> do everything that we could to try to keep our residents engaged and meet them where they were at. Uh, there's one thing that we were doing with that was starting to build some success for them that I am looking forward to being able to get back to, and that's um, we have ward council members, and so like we're 
in the middle, for example, of updating our zoning ordinance community-wide. So it generates a lot of questions. Pre-COVID, we were going out and we were doing ward council meetings to have the opportunity for people to come in specifically from that ward and ask questions about the implications of making these zoning changes on their particular properties. Um, switching that over to an online platform um, met with kind of mixed success. Um, so we're hoping that we'll be able to do some hybridization of that moving forward, um, hopefully coming out of the other end of the pandemic uh, over the course of the next five to six months. Ron, thank you so much. I love the story. Uh, you've all talked a little bit about being flexible, uh, but I love the way that you kind of introduced that humanized approach to, to helping people live in a healthy way and using municipal capital and facilities for doing it. And um, that's a great story and, and congratulations on all of that. Douglas, can you talk about the tools that State College is using to help measure feedback from your residents? I think and in, in the pandemic really has has increased this. The amount of conversations that's online is is now endless, especially with people working from home, people being more connected digitally. Um, we had launched before the pandemic, actually, a, a tool called Zen City. Uh, uh, it's a, and it tracks all of the online um, discussions. And they have analysis, uh, analysts on, on staff that if you need a breakdown of a certain topic, they can pull it together. I actually have in front of me our winter weather online uh, discor uh, discourse uh, analysis. And so, like, even so, about our online snow removal, uh, we have a full, you know, three, four page report about feedback and benchmarking that to other similar communities. Uh, and, and we're actually meeting next week with our internal snow team to discuss changes and ways to improve our snow emergency communications. It's, it's really, you know, it's really a, a, a great way, uh, you know, a really innovative way for us to capture those feedback from people that are just talking online, from residents that are just talking online uh, without having to complete a survey, without having to uh, come to a council meeting to share their thoughts. It's, it's really uh, their online discussion is actually going to make impacts in the way that we operate and communicate moving forward. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool to be part of. It's pretty cool uh, to, to have that ability, have that technology in place to utilize that. Uh, other tools, uh, uh, as mentioned before, the MPSS uh, Polka, we also use Polka for a business needs survey. Um, uh, those type of, uh, we have a long history uh, uh, due to budgetary cuts, we no longer are using it, but we had bang the table to run an engaged state college platform, which uh, had online discussion people were able to post ideas and and get involved we used that throughout our strategic planning process that was really really helpful um and then the uh online council meetings i don't know if anyone else is experiencing this but you're getting feedback from a whole new sector of people that you've never gotten feedback for and they're regularly signing up regularly attending regularly raising their hands to get unmuted and and speak to council that it's it's pretty cool to to attract people and and i think it's a much more um um, advantageous way to engage because they don't have to drive downtown park come in wait for the meeting to start raise, you know get up and, and speak in front of a, a council chambers they're able to do it from the comfort of their own home they're able to call in they're able to you know uh have dinner on have you know uh have you know even sometimes tv in the background uh, have a little bit of uh, producing like hey can you please turn down your tv we're getting a little bit of an echo uh <laughs> situation but it was just a, a you know it's a it's cool to just see how this pandemic has has impact impacted the the traditional ways that we've gotten feedback and and these these new innovative ways that that are going to be there to, to last for a long time that's that's super that's great that's good to hear um <clears throat> that virtual audience at the council meetings and having the opportunity to give that input is such a is such a valuable way to get input um we just actually launched a tool called poco live you may be aware of it doug but where you actually can capture that information and and actually then organize the data and then map it out by neighborhoods it's a pretty pretty cool tool um Hey, Lon, can you talk about the tools that you're using in Marion to help you measure feedback? Yeah, I think this is an area where um, we greatly expanded the use of uh, online platforms and online surveys during the course of this. 
we've been using the National Citizen Survey for a while. And so that one was one that uh, you, we would use to kind of periodically benchmark how we were doing with the community. Um, but as some of these events unfolded, whether it was COVID, whether it was the Dre Show, um, whether it was uh, issues around equity and inclusion, um, we, we uh, proactively went out and sought the community's opinions. Uh, that was an area, I'll give your company some credit, Matt Polko was providing some tools that we were able to use for that. And since your merger with National Citizen Survey, being able to use those and have it all integrated was pretty helpful for us. And especially, uh, Doug talked a little bit about um, activities around police issues and civil unrest. Um, we created a, a task force on equity and inclusion last fall, um, really kind of during the height of a, a lot of the events that were going on. And we used um, the equity and inclusion survey tool to help provide us with a benchmark of how we're actually doing as a community. And it's something that we'll continue to use going forward just to measure, you know, how well are we addressing the issues that that uh, survey results really kind of laid bare to us. So between us and then our community partners helping to push those survey tools out, um, we've been able to uh, kind of keep track uh, of what people's immediate needs are. Um, because we had those dual forces with COVID and the Duray Show, the business surveys actually were very valuable for us because we could um, gather information, not quite continuously, but every couple of weeks because the situations were evolving very quickly um, to kind of track what the immediate needs were um, almost to a business district by business district level. Um, the other thing I would say is we really stepped up our game with the use of GIS as a platform for gathering data um, because uh, so much of the community was impacted by our disaster as the uh, building inspection staff was going around and doing damage assessment surveys for information that we had to provide to FEMA. Um, we actually created some gathering data gathering applications so they could go out and do that kind of stuff online and it would feed it right into our centralized database. So they could literally walk through the city and if they saw that a street sign had been knocked over, they could take a picture of it, they could geotag it and it would upload it right into the GIS database. So when it came time to start looking at help for what we needed for recovery, um, uh, whether it's good or bad, I've been doing this long enough that I've been now through, I think, about four or five major disasters. And we've never had that complete an inventory of the community needs um, when FEMA came to town in any of the other ones that we've had. So uh, we've been really using a lot of those electronic tools to enhance it. And I expect that that's probably something that we're going to continue to do going forward. That's great, Lon. Thanks. That's a great accomplishment to have that infrastructure all inventoried and the, your ability to use your GIS for taking it and, and responding to it. <clears throat> um, what a valuable resource that is. Lon, can you, I, I'm kind of curious on um, uh, how do you view benchmarking and use benchmarking in terms of just kind of tracking your performance? I think one of the biggest things for us is to make sure that um, as we start to talk about benchmarking, and I'll use the uh, equity and inclusion survey as an example, um, at the time that we were distributing it was at a time where um, not everybody had access to power, let alone uh, the internet. So we were able to extend the deadline on that and gather data for um, about an extra month, month and a half. Um, but as we kind of went down and go start looking at where, um, where the responses came from and the demo demographic breakdown of the people that responded. Um, we didn't hit enough of the people that would be negatively impacted or that might have had uh, negative experiences in the community around issues of equity and inclusion. But we do at least have a benchmark and we know what the prevailing overall opinion is. So that will help us guide our work around um, what we should really seek to address first. Is it issues around police? Is it issues around uh, inclusion regarding um, whether or not someone is transgender, whether or not uh, they happen to be of a different religion? You know, what, what are kind of the hot spots in the community and where do we need to start? Um, and then as we get more connected with some of the other surf uh, residents in the community will be able to get better data as we move forward. We do plan on really kind of using that as our baseline, but then complementing it by doing a series of community conversations. So our uh, equity task force has a subcommittee on communications and they're working with my communications staff right now to put together a plan for how we're going to go out and, and engage the community to just hear stories about what people have actually encountered. It's one thing to see data, but um, especially what happens around issues of 
equity and inclusion is the story itself is important because the story is what gets repeated to family and friends. And then that gets repeated to additional family and friends. And the stories are what influences the reputation uh, of a community a lot more than the uh, perception that people necessarily have. And so um, that's going to be an area where we're planning on initially focusing on doing it um, through online means, uh, community conversations that would be convened uh, using online platforms. And then as more of the community is vaccinated and we have more opportunities to do in-person discussions, we'll move that direction. So it's important for us, you know, we're using that data to establish our baseline. Um, we don't have the expectation that if we tried to repeat the survey in six months that we're going to see any significant movement of the needle. I think it's important for us to realize that to influence real societal change, um, that's a year by year or generational um, change before you're really going to start to see progress on that. So um, at, a, at a minimum, we would look to repeat those yearly, but probably every other year is going to be more of an opportunity to show us if we've really actually made significant progress. That's great. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Lon. I really appreciate that perspective. Brenda, can you talk about the tools that you're using in Cedar Park for helping to track resident perspectives? Sure. I don't know that they're that much different than what we've heard, but uh, we definitely are. Um, we did our first citizen survey in 2019, like as a, uh, at, at that time, I, you know, we used surveying before, but we'd not done an, an entire community survey. And so that was actually the first time that we did that. So we are in the process of repeating that uh, using Polko. And so we're very interested to see what, this will be our first year to actually be able to compare to ourselves. And so um, I don't know what kind of impact the last year will have had on, on maybe what some of those results are. So I think we're all really interested. We're in the middle of that right now. But we're also doing that within our own workforce. I mean, we've talked about community being our cities and absolutely they are, but you know, our workforce has been our workforce has been in the middle of this the entire time as well. And so um, having some opportunities to get some feedback from from our workforce. I, you know, when we look at this last year, over two-thirds of our workforce were at work every day because that's the nature of their jobs. And so um, it's been a little different than I think what, what we saw in other parts of our business community. And so really having some opportunities to get some feedback um, from, from our own workforce who've been part of, gosh, not just service delivery, but problem solving and information sharing and who are part of our community. And and um, I know one of the things that we've done during this time is also try to highlight for our community, like here, you know, here's what's happening at your local government level. Here are the folks that are providing uh, services for you every day. And so that um, being able to continue to have some of those opportunities to, again, sort of create this larger sense of community, I think continues to be important. So using surveying, using, um, you know, snippets of that we, we, snippets of video that then we share through social media and other mechanisms, really working with our HOAs, um, our homeowners association. Douglas talked a little bit ago about really knowing what's happening in, in your neighborhoods and your communities and still using, again, uh, surveying tools, um, and then other online platforms to help get information uh, out into our community and get information back from our community. That's great. <clears throat> um, you guys have all just presented such wonderful perspectives. I, this has been just like a great panel. Um, so many um, innovative, adaptive, flexible, uh, personal experiences. I mean, just a uh, just wonderful conversation. Do you, any of you have questions for each other? This would be the best time to, <laughs> to uh, have those conversations. I would just tell Brenda that um, our snow removal satisfaction on our citizen survey is around 84 to 86%. So be interested in uh, what you get on your survey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's actually a question on ours. However, uh, it was... Yeah, it was quite an event. I, I have said lovingly, um, I don't 
I don't mind if I never see a snowflake in Cedar Park, Texas again. <laughs> yeah, what a what a unique experience that was for you, for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we had, I, I drove in uh, to work today in a snow flurry in central Pennsylvania, so. <laughs> you know, uh, it was an experience is all I can say at this point. There were those, those who have migrated into Texas from, from cold areas were like, I don't get it. Hmm. The rest of Texas was like, Burr, it's really cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me uh, kind of wrap up this conversation. Um, this has been a great panel conversation because you've talked about um, so many different aspects. I mean, just the way that communities have had to be flexible, adaptive, <clears throat> capitalizing and leveraging on all of your community partners uh, to help make it work, uh, especially because you've had, you know, um, a variety of different kinds of challenges that you've had to meet over the past year. And I think those things have really kind of helped to lead into building that sense of community. I do love, and I think that the conversations that communities are going to be having more, and I'm really glad you guys brought it up, is that the conversation becomes more of a regional conversation on maintaining a sense of community. And Lon, I totally resonate with your perspective about um, things that you do in local government sometimes don't really uh, get appreciated except uh, except for the next generation. And so those decisions that you make, you may not see the benefit of that for a very long period of time, but you got to continue to operate and you got to continue to focus on it. And that's why the value of establishing performance systems and then tracking your performance and progress over time becomes so important in just terms of being able to be transparent be able to demonstrate the success that you've had. And I'm glad that our tools have been able to help your communities in, um, mm -hmm. in accomplishing some of those. Um, uh, really appreciate the input and the thoughts that you had around the tools that you're using and just the way that you've been able to kind of manage the storm. Douglas, I really appreciate uh, you bringing up the relationships that you have built during the calmer times so that when you do get into these kind of challenges that there are systems in place and uh, so that you can actually rely on those connections and those those levels of trust. We do know that local government uh, is did become more trusted, especially as it's compared to other levels of government over the past year. And I think it's because through the challenge, all of the municipal employees have stepped up and you've been able to demonstrate and to uh, account for and bring as local government leaders to the community. So uh, just a wonderful conversation and really appreciate the perspectives that you have all shared. Um, so <clears throat> again, thank you for being part of the conversation. Um, I will follow up with you to give you contact information for each of you. And, uh, you know, we do these conversations every week. And so if you know of anybody that might enjoy having this conversation, uh, we're going to be shifting the flavor of the conversation into more about how communities can take advantage of the American Rescue Plan Act and, um, assessing needs and then tracking your performance. Um, but I'd love to get any recommendations of folks who you think might be uh, helpful in these conversations. Um, you'll start seeing these highlight segments uh, within the next week on LinkedIn, and we're really hoping that you'll share them through your professional networks. Um, I would particularly love to get feedback from all of you, and I will call you over the next week just to kind of get a sense for what can we do differently and to make these things better and to make these panel conversations more valuable and helpful for other local government leaders. So, um, with that, let me just thank you again. Uh, this has been a great panel conversation and, and um, always nice to uh, reconnect with former friends or, or friends and colleagues and always nice to meet new people. So um, with that, um, I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye y'all. Nice to meet you all. It was nice to meet you all too. <laughs>